Welcome and Khosh Ahmadi to today's latest talk by Farhang Foundation in collaboration with the Iranian Studies Initiative at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I am Ali Reza Ardakani, Executive Director of Farhang Foundation here in Los Angeles. We are a member supported non political, non religious, not for profit organization with the sole mission to celebrate and promote Iranian art and culture for the community at large. Today, we are very pleased to welcome our speaker, Dr. Janet Afari, the director of the Iranian Studies Initiative at UC Santa Barbara for Mullah Nasreddin of Tiflis and the diasporic milieu that gave birth to it. This series is co-organized by the Graduate Center for the Literary Research at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and with the support of the Geramian Emrani Foundation and Duncan and Suzanne Mellencamp Funds. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Sven Speaker, Professor of Germanic and Slavic Studies at UC Santa Barbara. Thank you, Ari Reza, uh, for this introduction. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this talk, uh, and more specifically, to uh, introduce my co-organizer and colleague, uh, Dr. Janet Afari, who is a professor of religious studies at the University of California in Santa Barbara. Um, I won't list the many, many article publications that uh, Dr. Afari has under her belt, but I would like to give you a brief overview of the books she has published. Um, the first book uh, Dr. Afari published was entitled Sexual Politics in Modern Iran. It came out with Cambridge University Press in 2009 and is the winner of the British Society for Middle East Studies Annual Book Prize. Her next book entitled The Iranian Constitutional Revolution was published in 1996 with Columbia University Press and was the winner of the Dehoda Institute Book Award. Her next book was a study of Foucault and the Iranian Revolution, uh, Gender and the Seductions of Islamism. This book was published in 2005 with Chicago University Press, and it too won a prize, namely the Latifi Yashater book award, book award for Iranian Women's Studies. Um, the next book came out in 2016. It's entitled Charando Parand, Revolutionary Satire in Iran, Yale University Press, 2016. And at the moment, Dr. Afari is working on a book uh, about, the, um, about the journal, about the magazine that she will speak to us about today, namely Molo Nasreddin, The Remaking of a Modern Trickster. This book is scheduled to appear with Edinburgh University Press in 2022. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Janet uh, to, to her talk, and I look forward to your questions and comments afterwards. Janet, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Sven, for that introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Ali Rizzo, for that introduction. I appreciate it. Um, let me start by sharing screen here. All right, I'm going to be speaking on a book that uh, we're publishing uh, in August of this year and uh, try to give you a summary of some of the things we do in the book. Um, although the book is quite lengthy, it's over 300, has over 330 images and over 400 page text, so I'll try to do best I can. The reinterpretation of myths and folklore has been an essential genre in literature. Uh, we've seen it from the ancient Greek world to our contemporary societies. Writers such as Maxine Hong Kingston and Toni Morrison who have reinterpreted old tales to forge new social criticisms. Our forthcoming book, Mullah Nasruddin, The Making of a Modern Trickster, is a historical exploration of such a genre in Azerbaijani-speaking people of South Caucasus. The book looks in the milieu in which the periodical Mullah Nasruddin was born, the manner through which the journal was reproduced the trickster trope of Nasruddin for its audience, and the influence of European graphic arts on its cartoons and illustrations. Now, this is a map of South Caucasus, the area that I'm talking about. Um, this is during the Safavid Empire, um, roughly speaking, before 1722. And the area, if you look at the map of Iran, the yellow, 
Um, the area north of where it says Tabriz, um, uh, Aras River, uh, it's called Aran. Um, that area uh, was, of course, part of the Iranian Empire. But at the beginning of the 18th century, through a series of wars, it became part of the Russian Empire. So today it's comprised of the countries of Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, as well as parts of southern Russia. So this is the region that I'm talking about. Um, Russian colonialism was different from its British and French counterparts in important ways. The Muslims of South Caucasus, Jews and other non-Christians were considered third-class citizens. First-class citizens were, of course, Russian Orthodox Christians. The second-class ones were Catholics and Protestants. The Tsar state, though, settled on a policy of religious toleration towards minority communities instead of forced conversion or expulsion. So administrative offices worked closely with Muslim clerics to implement Sharia law. And in the process, they created what's called an Islamic church for Shia Azerbaijanis that historically did not have a centralized doctrinal authority. Now, minorities were subject to numerous restrictions and religious tests for high positions. They could not serve on most locally elected councils. They faced restrictions on the sale of their property and could not be shareholders in corporations. In any legal dispute between a Christian and a Muslim or a Jew, the Christian would be, of course, favored by the courts. This is a cartoon from the Punch of London from about 1891, Jews of Russia. The Russians did see the Muslim population as exotic, backward, uncivilized, and even dangerous as people who needed to be disciplined and educated by the state. So we can use terms such as colonialist and orientalist to refer to the conduct of the Tsarist authorities. But the Muslims were not powerless subjects and subalterns. By 1905, there were a number of extremely wealthy cosmopolitan Muslim industrialists in Baku who wholeheartedly supported the religious and educational reform movement of the region. Uh, this is a cartoon of Haji Zainullah Bedine Tariyev, uh, one of these great philanthropists. Muslim Azerbaijani communities established their own newspapers and journals, theaters with a strong group of playwrights, multiple charitable societies, their own private school for girls, as well as many other modern institutions. This cultural renaissance of Muslim South Caucasus was an indigenous movement and by no means a colonial enterprise. Indeed, the Tsarist regime was quite reluctant to support efforts at religious reform among the Azerbaijani speaking people, especially the education of Muslim girls. The government feared the backlash by the clerics, with which, of course, it worked very closely. So unlike India under British colonialism, Muslims of South Caucasus under Tsarist colonialism exercised much agency. The intellectuals of this community selected what they perceived to be the best aspects of their Shi'i Iranian Azerbaijani culture. They blended it with new educational, literary and artistic cultural productions, um, both the ones that they had created themselves, Jadidism, here we have a cartoon of the Usul Jadid, and the Russian and European society's accomplishments to create a truly indigenous modern Muslim Azerbaijani culture. And they did so years before the 1917 Russian Revolution and the establishment of the Soviet Union, as our story will hopefully demonstrate. Now, who are the members of the editorial board? In 1906, a group of artists and intellectuals reinterpreted the tales of the Middle Eastern trickster Nasreddin to construct a progressive anti-colonial discourse with a strong emphasis on social, political, and religious reforms. The founder and editor of the journal was Jalil Polizadeh, commonly known as Mirza Jalil. He was an Azerbaijani educator and playwright. His wife, Hamide Khanum Javanshir, who joined him in 1907, was an early Azerbaijani feminist and a philanthropist and really the financial backer of the journal throughout its existence. There were other gifted members on the editorial board, Ali Akbar Tahirzadeh Saber, a brilliant poet who revolutionized Azerbaijani literature, Abdul Rahim Bey Hakdardiyev, 
playwright, stage director, and a member of the first state Duma of the Russian Empire. Narimona Narimonov was quite well known to Iranians, was a medical doctor, novelist, leader of the Social Democratic Himmat Party, which had a huge influence on the branches of the Fergei Eshtemoyun Amiyun Social Democratic Party in Iran. Mohammad Saeed Urdubadi, a prolific correspondent and writer who covered the revolutionary events in Iran during the Tabriz Civil War, 1908-09. And the principal artists were Oscar Schmeling, Joseph or Yusef Rotter, and Azima Azimzadeh, who together are the co-founders of the art of caricature in South Caucasus. Moller Nasruddin exceeded the accomplishments of these individuals and led to the creation of a satirical school of thought in Azerbaijani literature through their collaboration. Using folklore, visual arts, satire, their eight to page 12 weekly, which had full page color lithographic cartoons, reached tens of thousands of people across the Muslim world, impacting the thinking of a generation. The most creative period of Mullah Nasruddin were the years 1906-12, when a highly talented of artists, writers, and poets were staff members. The key to this very successful cultural melange was the creative use of the trickster figure as a medium of social criticism. The traditional wise fool, the trope of the folk character Nasruddin, with which every child in the Middle East uh, and diaspora probably is quite familiar, broke conventional boundaries of thought and morality revealed the hypocrisy of the existing social order, ridiculed the overbearing theologian, the conceited scholar, the indolent aristocrat, and the autocratic king. Using the trope of the folk Nasruddin, the periodical Mullah Nasruddin also brought down to earth and debased powerful contemporary figures, creating space for new ways of thinking about relations of power in society. The 1880s saw an oil boom in Baku and the spirit of industrialization in certain parts of the Caucasus, which brought European and American investors, as well as migrant workers from Iran and the Ottoman Empire to the region, leading to significant economic growth. But as more wealth was generated, economic inequity of the region widened, particularly in the city of Baku. New political parties in response were formed to address this inequity, especially various social democratic organizations affiliated with the Russian Social Democratic Workers Party, both the Bolshevik and the Menshevik branches. But Tiflis, where Mullah Nasruddin was actually published, was the administrative and cultural capital of Tsarist Russia's southwestern peripheries, and was a magnet for artists. A majority of his residents were Armenians with large numbers of Georgians and Russians. The city also had a small Shi Muslim population, both long-term Caucasus Azerbaijanis and migrant workers from Iran. It was a vibrant center of politics, an eclectic cosmopolitan city where artists, playwrights, and journalists of these diaspora communities safely interacted and added to the city's cultural diversity. Mullah Nasruddin soon captured the imagination of a wide sector of the Muslim world. Historians of South Caucasus and Iran have called the birth of the journal a historic moment in the annals of the region. In his first year of publication, Mullah Nasruddin had a circulation of 25,000, of which 15,000 were subscribers inside Iran. As you can see, there were more Iranians reading it than people in the Caucasus. With its wide circulation, it reached a wide audience in the coffee shops and bazaars of South Caucasus, Iran, the Ottoman Empire, and as far away as Egypt and India. It was read aloud in these sp spaces to diverse groups, including many illiterate, urban workers and rural peasants. So its reach was really far beyond the number of its circulation. The periodical faced immediate and implacable opposition. South Caucasus and Iranian clerics issued fatwas against the journal. Still, it was smuggled across the border into Iran and other countries. Mirza Jalil's brother and other staff members crossed the border into Iran. 
They distributed the periodical in Tabriz during the civil war and in the trenches. They had also embedded what we call today embedded reporters from Mullah Nasruddin in Iran who covered the constitutional revolution and the Tabriz resistance from the ground. However, the journal was not anti-religious. Rather, it was the first publication in the Shia Muslim world to unapologetically reinterpret Quranic verses in light of modern social norms, including girls' education and greater reforms in marriage and divorce laws. Mullah Nasruddin called for freedom, justice, and constitutionalism, if you can see from the banners being held by the uh, women in the back, Hurriyat Qanun Asasi Va Edalat. Many writers of Mullah Nasruddin worked with the Social Democratic Himmat Party. They were committed to its platform of siding for social reform and against political despotism and religious orthodoxy. They promoted secular education, marital reforms, greater rights for women and children. They brought attention to the poverty of workers and peasants and they criticized many sacrosanct Shi rituals, such as self-flagellation, Sinazani, during the rituals of Maharam. So this one compares the Iranian uh, army to the army of flagellant uh, in the month of Maharam. The artists of the periodical played a crucial role in its success. They mingled modernist and social democratic artistic influences with older humanist traditions of classical Persian poetry, creating a new cultural and artistic discourse. There was modern traditions of graphic arts in the work, critiques of Shi rituals of penance, Azerbaijani poetry. The goal was to highlight the violence and hypocrisy of the European powers and to critique indigenous social and cultural practices. This one, um, European politics is represented by Satan. The graphics and cartoons of Mullah Nasruddin belong to a tradition of satirical art that stretches back really to 18th and 19th century European graphic arts. They were particularly influenced by the Spanish artist Francisco José de Goya and the French artist Honoré de Domier. But they also drew upon newer forms of caricature in British, German, and Russian satirical publications, the Critical Realist School of Art in Tiflis and St. Petersburg. These cartoons, the right by Rotter is uh, from Mullah Nasruddin and the left of course is Goya. Of course, success has many claimants. Uh, the Azerbaijan Republic rightfully recognizes the periodical as a founding contributor to modern Azerbaijani nationalism and a classic literary work. Iranian historians have claimed the periodical also as, if I should quote it in quotations, as one of their own, since many members of the editorial board belong to immigrant Iranian families, and also there was a large volume of articles and graphics about Iran in the periodical. <clears throat> the Georgian Republic also has a claim on Mullah Nasruddin as it was published in Tiflis. One factor that made the journal a sensation was its cartoons primarily drawn by Georgian German artists, Oscar Schmerling and Joseph Rotter. In reality, we should say Mullah Nasruddin belonged to a transnational diasporic society. In this region, uh, before the birth of modern nationalisms, Russian, Caucasus, Azerbaijanis, Georgians, Germans, Armenians, Iranians, Jews, and other ethnicities of a variety of religions, cultural and political persuasions mingled on a daily basis and shared a common territory. Indeed, the theme of diaspora, of living in transition between cultures and of crossing borders is a very prominent one in the pages of Mullah Nasruddin. As a transnational publication, Mullah Nasruddin never limited itself to the local concerns of the Azerbaijani Muslims of South Caucasus. Rather, from the very beginning, Mullah Nasruddin saw itself as a mouthpiece for other persecuted Muslim populations and even other colonized people around the world. This one carving of Fez, Morocco by the European powers as the Ottoman uh, leader 
uh, watches and the Iranians are dancing and the Indians are fanning themselves. The editor and several uh, writers of the periodical um, grew up in Azerbaijani speaking Shia communities, uh, but they had strong affinities to Iran. Mirza Jalil, for example, was born in Nakhchivan. His grandparents migrated from Iran to the South Caucasus. The family was heavily identified with Iranian culture. Various contributors to Mullah Nasruddin visited Iran. Um, they traversed through the shallow river. They went there to start new business and occasionally fled to Iran from Russian persecution. As a result, we may think of the journal as a transnational diasporic periodical in Azerbaijani language that was heavily influenced by Iranian culture and social practices. This hybrid identity of the contributors to Mullah Nasruddin has been of great interest to Iran and Azerbaijani scholars, among them Rahim Rezazadeh Malik, Rahim Reisnya, Samad Sardorinya, and of course, Hassan Javadi with his collaborator, William Four, who published in 2016, The Memoirs of Hamid Khanum, all of whom have emphasized the great continuity between the Iran and Azerbaijani and the Caucasus Azerbaijani cultures. <clears throat> like many other diaspora communities, the writers of Mullah Nasruddin felt torn between their close religious, cultural, and ethnic bonds to Iran, their desire to assert their Azerbaijani language and cultural heritage, and their need to further assimilate within the greater Russian society to succeed professionally. This feeling of in-betweenness, of wanting so deeply and passionately to belong to one place or the other, and it's finding that there really was no one place where one could find oneself at home vividly comes through in many of the columns, poems, and graphics. This one is the Azerbaijani speaking person uh, who is being forced to speak all these other languages, Persian, Arabic, and Russian, but not his own language. In its initial most creative six years, the editorial board Board wrote about four major political events. The Russian Revolution of 1905-06, which led to the constitutional reforms and a free press in Russia, but ended tragically with massive casualties. The Armenian Muslim Wars of 1905-07, which saw the devastation and pillage of hundreds of Armenian and Azerbaijani villages. The Iranian Constitutional Revolution of 1906-11, which brought a parliament, majlis, and a constitution to Iran for the first time before being de defeated by invading Russian forces. <clears throat> and the Young, Young Turk Revolution of 1908, which restored the Ottoman constitution and brought about a multi-party regime. All, all of these historic events were discussed and analyzed in the pages of the periodical. The cartoon here was published in the fall of 1908, actually in anticipation of the attack of the anti-constitutionalists in this case, represented by Satan, uh, putting Sheikh Fazlullah Nuri on his back as they're getting ready to attack the Iranian much less. Now, recent uh, cultural and diasporic studies have explored migrants from India, China, Africa, Middle East, who settled in the more industrialized metropolitan cities of Europe and the United States, or in post-colonial Caribbean societies and form several generations of diasporic societies marked by constant dualities. These migrants no longer anticipated a day when they could go back to home, so to speak, and resume their quote unquote normal lives, but neither were they fully integrated into the new place. Such diasporic communities abandoned much of their old culture without assimilating into the new one. Cultural theorists Hamid Nafisi and Stuart Hall and others have argued that a diaspora community is often suspended in midair, in between places. It faces a daily clash of cultures, which it constantly has to negotiate. The collision of cultures, including in religious precepts and the contestations of traditional modes of thought and also modernity can have two results. It could result in a generally defensive, intolerant reaction to the culture of the new home, with which we are all too familiar when we call them in the names of various fundamentalisms, 
or it could lead to refreshingly innovative, complex and progressive perspectives and practices, a form of cross fertilization that does not fully replicate the binary of the old homeland and the new homeland, the East and the West. And this latter is what we're suggesting happened in the case of Mullah Nasruddin. Transnational scholar Janine Dahinden has shown the diversity that can exist within a particular diaspora community and its relationship to the home of origin. It could be four possible relationships between the migrants, their community of origin, the sending country, and their homeland, the receiving country. They could become diaspora transnational. These are longtime migrants with deep anchorage in the receiving country. They often live a middle-class life. Their children speak the language of the new country fluently. Their ties to the sending country manifest themselves in cultural efforts, such as establishing bilingual education for children, charities and benevolent associations, as well as journalistic, literary, and artistic activities. Then there are the mobile or exilic transnationals. These are first-generation immigrants who still have strong familiar ties to the sending country and might go back from time to time. Then we have seasonal workers with visas go back and forth annually. And finally, asylum seekers and undocumented migrants who are unable to sink food in either country. These are not hard and fast categories. People might move from one to the other in the course of their lives. But what about the editorial board of Mullah Nasruddin? A few were from families that were native to South Caucasus. Hamid Khanum, for example, belonged to a native Caucasus Azerbaijani family that had ruled the Karabakh Khanat since the 18th century. That territory was incorporated into the Russian empire in the early 19th century, but the family maintained its size with distant relatives in Iran. Most Mullah Nasruddin contributors belong to the first and second categories. They were diasporic transnationals and mobile transnationals. Mirza Jali's grandfather, for example, had emigrated from Iran and Azerbaijan, making Mirza Jali a third generation immigrant, quite well versed in the Russian language and culture. And he had never been back to Iran really until 1920. Some members of the editorial board, such as Saber, had been mobile transnationals at one point in their lives. Saber was born in Shamohi in South Caucasus, traveled to Iran frequently, and for a while worked in the eastern city of Ishqabad in Khorasan before returning to Tiflis. Mirza Jali's younger brother, Mirza Ali Akbar, was also a mobile transnational. He lived in Iran for several years, even took part in the Constitutional Revolution. He was close friends with Sattar Khan, the national hero of the Tabriz Civil War. In 1909, he was arrested in Iran and then exiled by Russian authorities for his political activities. These ties to Iran became useful after the Russian Revolution of 1917. During the, Tabri the Russian Civil War of 1918-21, Mirza Jalil and Hamid Khanum sought refuge in Tabriz. They might have stayed permanently if the radical nature of their journal had not rattled the Persian-centric and socially conservative local government of Iranian Azerbaijan. The Tabriz authorities, for example, asked Mirza Jalil to publish Mullah Nasruddin in Persian, which he refused. Likewise, they asked Hamid Khanum who had never worn the veil to wear the veil, which she also refused. These factors, plus their deep ties to South Caucasus, were important in their decision to return. And when in 1921, the new Bolshevik government invited them to return and resume publication in Baku at state expense, they did. Not all the transnationals were related to Iran. Um, some were from other countries. For example, the associate editor Omar Faik, who was Sunni, had relatives in Turkey where he had studied for several years. He might have stayed in Turkey if the Ottoman police had not chased him out for his political activities with Ottoman constitutionalists. The artists also were transnational. Oskar Schmerling grew up in Tiflis. He belonged to a migrant German community which had settled in Tiflis decades ago. 
but he also went back to Munich to study for a few years as many members of the mostly Protestant Georgian German community did. Joseph, or actually his name is Yusef Rotter, was a German Jew. He was a more recent migrant to Tiflis who returned to Germany when World War I started in 1914, after which we don't know about his whereabouts. The Iranian migrant workers of Tiflis, Baku, Yerevan, and other cities were discussed in the pages of Mullah Nasruddin, mostly belong to the category of seasonal or undocumented workers. So the journal's preoccupation with migrant Iranian workers stem from the writer's real or imagined ties to the Iranian Azerbaijani homeland and an attempt to maintain some of their ethnic, national, or religious boundaries over generations. Often it was not due to intimate familial or communal ties. The tendency to address the needs of seasonal workers most probably stemmed from their political leanings, particularly the journal's loose commitment to social democracy and the desire to ameliorate the lives of marginalized migrants um, of their community. What about the graphics of the journal and how do we read them? German, Polish, and ethnic Russian artists came to Tiflis in the 19th century and played an important role in the artistic renaissance of Tiflis. They taught painting, drawing, sculpture, and architecture in the art schools of Tiflis. Local artists of Tiflis were inspired by European artistic conventions while creating their own local art. Gradually, a triangular relationship had developed. Students would start um, at the Tiflis Fine Arts Society, and then they would continue their education at the St. Petersburg Academy of Arts. And then if they were proficient, they would go to the Munich Academy of the Arts. Uh, the picture here is of the Munich Academy of Arts to complete their education. And this is what Schmerling and Rotter both had done. They were trained at the Munich Academy of the Arts. Um, the uh, artists of Tiflis, as well as our artists, were also influenced by the Wanderer School, a radical Russian school of art, as well as by various left of center progressive movements. Following these new ways of thinking, they broke with the colonial artistic mindset and became pioneers of critical realism in Tiflis. Their work began to show a greater affinity for a wider variety of cultures and peoples. The artists of Mullah Nasruddin belonged to this generation of artists. They were critical of colonial Russian and European domination, while also inspired by the European artistic heritage. At the same time, they remained attuned to the sensibilities of their South Caucasus and Central Asian societies, an earlier work by Schmerling before he became a cartoonist. Now, <clears throat> European conventions of caricature are based on many races, sexist, and orientalist views of the East and involve the pseudoscience of physiognomy. Physiognomy means melding of human and animal features in discussing the characteristics of different nations in their cartoons. So this is a very good example of that. Uh, it's called the Lions Just Share. It's after the Britain's conquest of the Urabi revolt in Egypt in 1882 was published in Punch of London. Britain, of course, is the lion. The crocodile is, of course, Egypt. And you can see the rest of the animals, including the Russian bear, standing around, quivering, waiting for the lion to finish so that they could maybe get a little bit of the spoils. The idea behind physiognomy was that one's appearance determined one's character. So those that were endowed with European definitions of beauty were seen as inherently ethical and moral, but people with physical deformities or according to European standards, unattractive features were seen as morally corrupt. Satirical and illustrated European journals, including the British Punch, used elements of physiognomy to suggest that there was a racial hierarchy among nations and people. So here we have the drugged out Ottoman Sultan Hamid, as the European nations are discussing what to do with the, um, you know, the six, so the six, six Ottoman, which is what the way the word that they used it. Mullah Nasruddin also used uh, physiognomy in its work, um, but the application of physiognomy in the pages of Mullah Nasruddin 
was along ideological rather than racial lines. So clerics, merchants, political leaders, traditional women who opposed modern education, all were drawn with typically unflattering features such as angry eyes, long droopy nose, animal features suggesting they were conceited, corrupt, uneducated, and generally untrustworthy. Here we have the Tabriz famous Mujtahid and his polygamous marriages represented by various hens around him, veiled hens, I might add. But progressive clerics, merchants, political leaders, and advocates of women's education were drawn with large transparent eyes and handsome features. In this way, despite its appropriation of the flawed conventions of physiognomy, the artist of Mullah Nasruddin differed from European cartoonists who applied physiognomy in the service of racist ideologies. So how did the journal come to an end? Mullah Nasruddin lived through World War I, the 1917 Russian Revolution, the Russian Civil War of 1918-20, the birth and demise of the Azerbaijan Democratic Republic, 1918 to 1920, and finally the establishment of the Soviet Union. As the authority of Joseph Stalin, who's also from Tiflis, grew more draconian in the late 1920s, the fate of the contributors to the periodical was sealed. The Central Committee of the Azerbaijan Communist Party decided in 1931 that the periodical would now be called Allah Siz, godless, and become the origin of the League of Atheists. Mirza Jalil died of natural causes shortly after January of 1932 with a broken heart soon after the name change of his beloved journal. Hamid Khanum lived, uh, she, but she lived through great hardship in the uh, Soviet era, uh, but managed to write her memoir of her remarkable life, which was translated by Hassan Javadi and William Floor into English in 2016. Some of the writers perished in the turbulent 1930s. Some remained quiet. Some became propagandists for the Stalinist regime in order to survive. A few tried to protest and as a result faced brutal years or death in the labor camps of the Soviet Gulag. So let me conclude with the everlasting legacy of Mullah Nasruddin. The journal exposed the colonial and imperialist policies of the great powers in Middle East, North Africa, India, and even those of the United States and Japan in East Asia. It called for greater dialogue and friendship between rival ethnic and religious communities. It reported on major upheavals and achievements of the 1906 Iranian constitutional revolution and became a participant in the Tabriz civil war of 1908. It defied the Shia Muslim religious establishments in South Caucasus, Iran and Najaf and argued for a more progressive interpretation of Islam. It chastised the bays and landowning elites of the region and became a mouthpiece for the impoverished rural and urban classes. It encouraged the establishment of satirical journals and caricature not only in the South Caucasus and in the Muslim population, but among people of Iran, a tradition that survived all the way through the 1970s. And finally, it initiated a radical discourse on gender reform and called attention to the plight of women and children. And for all these accomplishments, Mullah Nasruddin will forever be considered a true literary gem of the early 20th century. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Janet, for this uh, truly inspiring, exciting talk. Um, and uh, I know there are some questions that came uh, to us already through the chat. So maybe I'll just uh, begin. Uh, so one question that came to us, uh, uh, Janet, is um, it's important to add the name of the poets Ali Nazmi and Ali Ruli Ram Kushar. The first one was the main poet after the death of Saber, and the last one was the editor during the period 1912 to 1913, when Jalid Mamad Kuluzadeh was in Karabakh. Yeah, thank you. That, that's absolutely true. My emphasis was on the first six years, which is when Sabar dies in 1912, but you're absolutely right. Um, if I may, I would like to inject a, a quick question. Um, I thought this was absolutely fascinating talk, and you made a few references to possible 
presidents, predecessors, um, including Goya. And I'm by no means a specialist on Goya, but one of the things that I remember is that with Goya, the satire often filtered through a literary layer. In other words, it wasn't a direct critique uh, of politics, uh, you know, or um, of the conditions uh, in, in Spain at the time, but it filtered through proverbs uh, and sometimes literary texts. And I think you hinted that this was the case uh, with Molon Asteridin as well. I wondered if you could perhaps comment on that. And then a second question, if I may, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the relationship between the journal or the magazine and Azerbaijani nationalism. Right, so the answer to your first question is that yes, this was really one of the most fascinating aspects of the journal in that they uh, commonly refer to classical Persian poems and proverbs known Azerbaijani and Persian both in their work. And a lot of times the caption to these works of art would actually be a poem or a common saying that was known to the Azerbaijani and Iranian people. So the journal is an incredibly important contribution to Azerbaijani nationalism, and it has been celebrated as such. I believe there are more than a thousand dissertations devoted to the journal in the Azerbaijani language. There are statues, uh, um, which I visited when I was there, of Jalil Mamad Golizadeh, of Saber, and celebrations, really routine celebration and recognition of their historic achievement. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to read another wonderful um, message that came to us through the chat. It's not a question, but um, this, uh, this listener says, sending my appreciation. I was born and grew up in Karachi, Pakistan. And I remember reading Mulan Asreddin in Urdu as a child, learning, I learned a lot of interesting history through this session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, then uh, there is another question in the chat that says, to what extent is the journal known today in popular culture in Iran and Azerbaijan? Does it remain a reference for caricature in this part of the world? It remained a reference for caricature all the way through the late 1970s. Uh, the best example would be the uh, uh, caricature journal Tofiq. And uh, you, know, you thumb through the pages of Tofiq from the 1960s and 1970s, you come across cartoons that really directly reminds you of uh, the of the cartoons of Mullah Nasruddin. But um, the Iranians, of course, are Persian speakers. Um, the publication was in Azerbaijani language, so it was always accessible to the Azerbaijani-speaking people of Iran, but not always accessible to the Persian speakers. But the cartoons were reprinted, reproduced. They were um, made into uh, posters, uh, and it was just a very, uh, you know, common thing in Iranian uh, bookstores all the way through the 70s. Okay. Um, another question first congratulates you on a great talk, and then says Molon Astredin was um, anti-clerical, but not anti-Islamic, as you mentioned. But instead, it was a journal of modernizers uh, and that borrowed from secularizing efforts that came from the West. Um, how did they manage the tension between the modern and the secular on the one hand and the acceptance of the Islamic tradition on the other? Um, and this is similar, this, this listener says, to the dilemma that Jadids faced in Central Asia. How did they deal with the socialists um, who were also around at the time? I mean, they were threatened uh, with debt several times. Mirza Jalil, one of the reasons they were able to publish was that they were in Tiflis. And in fact, they didn't even live in Shaitan Bazar, which was the central location of the Muslim community. Rather, they transferred into the Christian part of the um, Tiflis so that they could be safe. So it wasn't safe for them to have lived within the Muslim community, even though they were in Tiflis, which, which has a small Shia community. So that certainly offered them a great deal of protection. But the other thing was, was that they were very, very careful in showing that they were not against religion, they were not against the Quran, that aspects of it, many aspects of it, they thought would be compatible with our modern world. They were primarily anti-ritual, anti-ritual. So anything that, and primarily I would say anti-Shi rituals. So practices of Muharram and Sina Zani and Ghamazani and all these other practices that are well known those are bonds that they were targeting. 
They were also against polygamy uh, and against the practice of both formal polygamy and temporary marriage and easy divorce. So these were the things that they were generally targeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is, do you consider Molona Sredin a magazine of the Iranian diaspora in Russia? Uh, don't you think that referring to any community that celebrates Norus as Iranian is rather a biased, a Pahlavian nationalistic view? Don't you think that the facts you brought up, for example, the refusal to publish the magazine in Persian indicates one thing and one thing only that this was a magazine of Azerbaijanis for whom the homeland uh, lays across the border, uh, both geographically and chronologically. So I'm not gonna get involved in politics, <laughs> but uh, what I can say is that Noruz certainly predates the Pahlavi era, uh, goes back centuries before the Pahlavis and has continued even under the government of the Islamic Republic. So the celebration of Noruz is part of that larger, what we call the Persianate culture, of which people even in Georgia, modern Republic of Georgia, and even parts of Pakistan uh, and certainly parts of Turkey, all of whom are not Persian speakers are celebrating. So we have this larger Persianate culture that is in common um, with these people. I am using the term diasporic here to talk about this particular experience because I was uncomfortable with the attitude of many Iranian scholars who were writing about them as if they were Iranians and many um, Azerbaijani scholars who were uncomfortable with what to do with their Iranian heritage that was very, very prevalent in the journal. And so it seemed to me that the category of diasporic would make sense. Uh, and having lived as a diasporic person for all these years myself, I, I felt the kinship, I would say, to that, to, the, to where they were and their location and locale. Thank you. Um, to what extent was there in Molana Nasreddin a perception of Iranian and other Muslims as members of the same community? In Iran, obviously, we can see this sentiment, uh, for example, when discussing the possible involvement of the Muslims from the Caucasus and also to a lesser degree, Muslims in general in the National Bank. Um, there's a, a second question tagged on, was the caricature um, uh, a, of showing the Majlis, I, I think this means a prediction or a commentary to the events that already had happened? No, it was actually so interesting. I had to check that date several times. It was uh, an anticipation of something that did happen. So as your uh, questioner is, uh, I'm sure is well know, knows. So the December of 1907 is first coup attempt. And then the successful coup is, is in June of 1908. So um, this is actually published in um, around September of 1907. So it's actually anticipating the failed coup on the Majlis. Thank you. I'm scrolling through lots of comments that just say wonderful lecture. Thank you. Um, so knowledgeable. So here's another question. Do you know about any contacts um, the writers or the editors of the magazine um, had to the editors of the Tiflis, Armenian and Georgian sat satirical journals, Khatabala and Eshmakis Matrachi? Schmerling and Rotter were equally important as carica caricaturists uh, for those journals. Right, so the connection I think is the artists, uh, as the artists were also working for Khatabala and um, there was also some indication, I could never quite find it for a Yiddish journal that was published in the region. So they would publish, they, I mean, they were artists, they were looking for work and um, they were working for all of his satirical, political, social, dem social democratic leaning, uh, left leaning, I would say they weren't working for any conservative publications, but they were working for all of these sort of progressive publications um, in the community. Okay, great. Maybe we have uh, time for one last uh, question. Um, uh, um, difficult choice because there are quite a few more. Uh, I'm happy to. I'll, I'm happy to answer to them later on. If yes. you send me, if they send me a list, yes. Yeah. So one of the cartoons you showed uh, an, Azerbaij an Azerbaijani being forced to speak other languages, such as um, Persian, I guess, and Russian. What was their language? Was, it was Azerbaijani. They spoke Azerbaijani, the Azerbaijani right. language yeah. and they got, but they wanted it taught at their schools um, and they wanted to get formal education in the Azerbaijani language. 
of the language and said that where education that we're getting it was in Russian. They were going to uh, schools that were Russian, where they learned Russian. And then the religious education they got was um, Arabic and in their community to some extent also knew some Persian. So that's why they're complaining that their language, they have no opportunity to learn um, and speak and learn, basically learn their language formally, the language that is their national language. Excellent. Thank you so much again, Janet, for Thank um, you talk and answering the question so well. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Afari. Thank you, Dr. Speaker. Um, we, as uh, Dr. Speaker said, we have a lot of questions. Um, so we will be forwarding those questions to Dr. Afari and hopefully she can answer them directly. Um, uh, as always, we are so grateful to Dr. Afari for today's remarkable talk on Mullah Nasruddin, as well as for her support in helping us set up the entire UC Santa Barbara collaboration with Farhang Foundation. Thank you. Thank you uh, again to Dr. Speaker for joining us today and to the entire UC Santa Barbara team for helping organize this talk series. Thank you again to all of you who have joined us from all over the world today. It is always a pleasure to welcome you to the series and all of Farhang's virtual programs. For now, farewell, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Dr. Afari. Thank you, Dr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.